Welcome to Practically Christian, where co-hosts Jake Silvera and Luke and Janelle Heron share conversations that help you know Jesus more deeply and follow him more faithfully. The truth is, no one has arrived at Christlikeness. To grow in that direction, we believe you need authentic relationships and biblical theology applied to your everyday life. We hope that you are encouraged to grow and to live out the biblical truths that we discuss on this episode. Let's get practical and dive into a conversation about AI. All right. Like you just heard, uh, we had artificial intelligence text-to-speech give our little introduction today because uh, in this new series of episodes, we're talking about artificial intelligence, or also known as AI. And so uh, this is going to be a three-part series. And so for today, the first part in this series, we're actually just going to hit play on an IQ Church lesson I gave to our church community about this subject of uh, AI in the Imago Dei, which is just Latin for the image of God. What does it mean to be human? And then what does that mean for the tools we use as humans? And how does AI fit into all of that? So I think this is going to be really helpful for you. It's also going to set the stage for our further conversations in this series. So uh, enjoy. Uh, IQ Church is something our church uh, tries to do somewhat, somewhat regularly, where we pick a subject or topic, and we seek to... Um, love God with our minds, right? Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, it includes our minds. And so we want to develop our minds. Uh, we know the life of the mind is important. Um, and the, the better our understanding is, oftentimes actually that goes with um, our discipleship and the way we live. And um, those things go together. Right understanding can lead to right living and also vice versa. So it's all important. Um, today we're talking about AI and the Imago Dei. Um, as we get started, uh, some of the questions we'll be exploring, like, um, do I need to be scared that our future is the matrix? Right? Do I need to be scared that some AI supercomputer is going to take over the world? Um, how concerned should I be about robotics? And uh, there seems like every other day there's a new story about an emerging robot that looks more human and acts more human. Like, is this really human? And that's a legitimate question because uh, if so, like, what does that mean for for rights? Um, So how do we think about this thing called AI or artificial intelligence? This has also been in the news a lot uh, this last year with uh, ChatGPT. Um, How many of you are familiar or heard ChatGPT mention the news, right? Um, Many of you, like, have heard that in the news. And if not, that's okay. It's just the newest newest, uh, iteration of AI. Um, now, what I want to be clear, I'm not going to be, like, this is, a not, this is not a class on how to use AI technologies. I'm not going to share with you how to use ChatGPT or something like that. Um, this is how to think Christianly about these questions we have about emerging technologies. So broad level overview. Um, <laughs> we're going to start with a short discussion about what... Uh, that stops glitching. Um, Narrow AI versus general AI. AI just stands for artificial intelligence, um, but there's an important distinction we need to make before we get going so that we're all thinking along the same direction. Uh, Then we're going to talk about humans being created in the image of God and what that means for us and the dignity of every human, but then also what that means for technology and what its proper place is in a Christian worldview. And then we're going to end with two kind of practical discussions. One side of the practical discussion is... um, things we need to be careful about to keep AI in its proper place. And then the other practical consideration is to keep the dignity of human beings, to work to preserve that as Christians. So if you don't understand all these terms at this point, that's okay. That's what we're going to be talking about. (laughs) All right, before we get going, uh, artificial intelligence. You hear that word artificial? Uh, Artificial means man-made, right? Man-made intelligence means smarts. Intelligence, um, as technology has advanced, um, it's actually a mind-blowing pace, right? Um, it was, ooh, I was trying to remember the date, like maybe 30 years ago when a computer program first beat the world-class chess player, right? Uh, where machines uh, were more intelligent at certain things than humans were. So how do we think about this? Well, uh, narrow AI versus general AI, okay? What is the difference? Narrow AI is narrow in the sense that it is designed and trained for only a small range of tasks, OK? 
okay? Small range of tasks. It's really good at doing one thing really well and even learning about that and improving, but that's it. Like it, it can't do other things outside of that domain. So for example, the technology that uh, Tesla uses in self-driving cars, right? Really good at driving cars for the most part. But if you were to try and use it for some other application, like for example, um, other AI technologies are used to analyze um, scans in the hospital. If you try to get the self-driving AI technology to do that, it would just break immediately. It cannot do what it's not designed to do. So it's narrow in that it's designed to do one task really well. Or again, like Deep Blue, the program that plays chess really well. Right? Plays chess really well. It does not do much of anything else very well at all. It's designed to do just one narrow thing or range of things, okay? Um, also, narrow AI or specific AI is the only kind of artificial intelligence we have in the world right now, okay? That's the only kind we actually have in this world. We do not yet have, and it's likely we will never have, uh, general AI. Now, general AI is what you probably think of when people say the word AI. It's what the average person thinks of, a thinking, self-conscious, machine. That's general AI. Um, if it were to be developed, the definition of it is that it's basically able to learn across different areas and be smart in all the various areas that humans are able to be smart in, right? Uh, we not only can use language, we can learn how to play instruments, and not only that, but we can learn how to write code, right? Uh, so a general AI would be able to do all these things, learn in all these various areas, but then most importantly too, it would, it would not only think, it would be self-aware that it was thinking. That's the big thing about general AI, right? It would not only think or compute, it would be aware that it was doing so. It would be self-conscious. That is general AI. We do not have general AI. And um, before we get going, um, it may be that general AI is impossible. There's a theological reason for thinking this, and then there's a practical reason, okay? Let me give you a theological reason first. And uh, as I prepared for this, I depended on some other scholars. Uh, John C. Lennox wrote a great book called 2084. And uh, Jason Thacker wrote a book called The Age of AI. So if you're looking to dig more deeply into the subject, I, I highly recommend both of these books. I have them. Uh, you're welcome to borrow them. Uh, but here's what John C. Lennox writes about this issue of even whether or not general AI, a self-aware thinking machine, is even possible. This is what he says about it. He says, Genesis tells us that when God created humans in his image, he linked intelligence and consciousness together in one being. For he himself is like that, a conscience, intelligent being. Conscience, in this case, means self-aware. However, God, who is spirit, links consciousness and intelligence together in a non-material being, right? So God is intelligent, self-aware, and self-conscious, but he's not material. He's not physical, right? God, God is spirit. Which means the fact that God is spirit shows that neither consciousness nor intelligence necessarily depend on physical material to exist necessarily depend on material substrate. Another reason to think that humans will never be able to make a conscious material machine. Uh, in other words, what he's saying is he thinks it's the non-physical part of us as humans that gives us our self-consciousness. And therefore, theologically speaking, it may not even be possible to create general level AI. Now, whether or not he's right, maybe it is possible. Maybe we'll get there someday. Um, but number one, that would bring in a lot of different concerns and issues than we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, today, we're focusing on narrow AI. Most importantly, because uh, this is the world we live in, where it, narrow AI is the emerging technology that's coming out. And not only that, you're already using it, whether you realize it or not. Uh, but also because if it even was possible, we're a long ways away from that. So mathematician Hannah Fry says, uh, for the time being, worrying about evil AI is a bit like worrying about overcrowding on Mars. Okay. It's kind of a joke, but to point out like, okay, maybe someday that could possibly be an issue, but we're a long ways away, all right? We don't need to be worried about that. Uh, Yan LeCun said, uh, whether we'll be able to use new methods to create human level intelligence, well, there's probably another 50 mountains to climb, technologically speaking, 
including ones we can't even see yet. We've only climbed the first mountain, maybe the second. So this is where we are. So I, I want to, first of all, if you're like, oh, AI taking over the world, all right, put your, put your shoulders down. Um, the people most involved with the coding of this are like, not sure it's even possible. And if it is, we're a long ways away from it. So let's talk about narrow AI. Narrow AI, remember, these are specific technologies that are really good at doing certain things and even learning how to do them better. So you have a picture of like self-driving cars. That's an example of narrow AI. And AI is actually everywhere. Um, how many of you use Alexa or Siri or Google Play in your home? All right, that is AI. That is a narrow form of artificial intelligence. It's really good at listening to human voices, connecting what you're requesting with your smart devices, right? Um, that is an example of narrow AI. Um, how many of you have a smartwatch of some kind? Right? Yeah. Uh, quick story. Uh, three months ago, I was riding my bike. I was mountain biking, and I'm still learning how to mountain bike. And I uh, was a little overconfident and went over uh, something I shouldn't have. I should have slowed down more. And the uh, front wheel went forward, and I fell over the handlebars. Uh, I was totally fine, and I was wearing a helmet. Um, and then I was like, you know, brush myself off, get back on my back. I was like, oh, that was kind of scary. And then, like, my watch is vibrating. I was like, what's going on? And I look down and it says, calling emergency services. You've had a fall. Like, click this button if you want to cancel this emergency call. It's like, wow, okay. And I canceled it, of course. I was like, that's amazing that, like, had I been unconscious, laying out there, emergency services would have been called and come and help me. Why? Because smart watches know what normal human movement feels like and what abnormal human movement feels like, right? Crashing to the ground and know what that means for human bodies um, and it's learning. Uh, other examples are, for example, when um, you upload a photo somewhere on the, online to social media or even when you put it on your Photos app and it knows it's a picture of you. That's facial recognition. That's an example of narrow AI. Uh, and I, for one, am grateful that we are past the days of tagging every single photo and drawing a circle around the face. Do you, do you guys remember doing that early days of Facebook where you had to say, this is my face, this is me. Next photo, this is my face, this is me. This is my friend. And then if you had a group of like 20 people, it was like, ah. And then people started to be like, tag yourself if you want to. I'm just putting their photos. I was in college when Facebook came out, can you tell? Um, Right, Self-driving cars, uh, everything from our news feeds, um, when you have a navigation app that stays up to date, right? There was just an accident. You need to change your route. That is narrow AI, right? It's really smart, really good at giving directions, but that's about all it can do. And I bring all this up for a reason. Um, I do not want you to think there's this thing called AI out there and I get to choose whether or not I use it. Right? The fact is narrow AI, uh, you're already using it. You're already interacting with it. And so we're not talking about some theoretical thing. Uh, we're actually talking about technology we're already using, and we need to think Christianly about valid uses or not of these kinds of emerging technologies. So this is very practical. So what does the Bible have to say about AI? We should attack it. Uh, sorry, couldn't help it. It's biblical, be against it. No, um, <laughs> no, people are like, wait, what, what do you mean what the Bible has to say about AI, right? Like the Bible's written, you know, thousands of years before we had uh, this kind of technology. Yes, uh, but actually the doctrine of humanity is key to understanding this right, I believe. Um, so we're gonna turn there. So if you have your Bible, you can open it up to Genesis chapter one, verses 26 through 28. Uh, this is really the key text and so we're going to spend a few minutes talking about it, what it means to be made in God's image and then what that means for the technologies we create and how to keep them in their proper place and think about them rightly. So here we are. It says, then God said, let us make man in our... Actually, let's pause. Uh, I'd like to pray first.
Let's pray together. Uh, God, as we think about this subject, would you give us wisdom and understanding? Um, as I've done a lot of reading and research and have lots of ideas floating around in my mind, would you give me clarity? Uh, would you help us to become followers of you who think um, not just clearly, but biblically about the issues we face? And would you use this time to shape and sharpen our thinking? And would you guide us all towards your truth, Jesus? In your name we pray. Amen. Verse 26, chapter 1 of Genesis. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. And so what the Bible teaches is that every single human is made in the image of God, and that being made in the image of God gives every human inherent value and dignity and worth. Now, there are actually a number of views. I, I took a master's level class on theological anthropology, where we spent, uh, in essence, the semester trying to understand and discern what does this mean? What does it mean to be made to, what does it mean to be made in God's image? And uh, there's some different options. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I want you just to be aware of them. Uh, some theologians and thinkers throughout Christian history have said um, the image of God is something that God actually puts in, into us, like our intelligence. Um, being made in God's image means you have a certain level of intelligence above the rest of the creatures. Other people say that the image of God in us is our capacity for relationship. The humans alone are able to have these deep relationships with each other and with God. That's the relational view. Others say it's the function of ruling, right? Did you catch how it said rule over the fish of the sea? So what it means to be made in God's image is this, um, this, this ability to rule and to exercise dominion over other creatures in the world in which we live. And the final view, and uh, if you ever get a list from someone Usually the last one is their view. In this case, that's, that's uh, what's true in this case as well. Um, I think the correct one is called something called the vocational view. It goes by different names. Uh, but I think there's some issues with the rest of these. If, uh, if you say the image of God is intelligence, well, what about someone who's mentally handicapped? Are they not fully in God's image? If you say it's relationship, well, what if you're alone on a desert island? Are you all of a sudden not in God's image because you're isolated? If you say it's ruling, you have the same problem with, like, are people who are really good at leadership, like, more in God's image? Are people who are really bad at it less in God's image? No, because everyone is fully in God's image. The vocational view says that God's image is not actually something inherently within us. It's this standard that God calls us to. That every human who has ever lived has had the same primary calling on their life or vocation from God. That God has a standard for what he wants humans to do and to be. It's like his blueprint for humanity. That's what God's image is. And all of us have that same blueprint we're supposed to go after. So John F. Kilner uh, writes this. He, said, he says, humanity's status is created in God's image, is rooted in the purpose and standard of human creation, not in what is descriptively true about people today. So it's not a descriptive, when it says we're made in God's image, it's not saying this is something you have or something you do. It's saying God has a way he wants you to be in this world. And that way he wants you to be is true for every single person. He has a calling on your life and every single life. Now, whether you agree with me or not, it is just true biblically, whichever one of those views you take. The humans are fundamentally different from the rest of creation. Why? Because we're created in God's image. No other creature is created in God's image. And also, nothing that humans ever create is created in God's image, right? Humans alone are created in God's image. And so every human possesses inherent dignity and worth because each of us are intended to reflect God in the world. So here's kind of the, the initial payoff, if you will, is that if 
general level AI we talked about, right? A thinking, self-aware technology was ever developed, even if it had human level consciousness, rationality, it would not be made in God's image. It would be made in our image in some ways. Um, it would not have inherent value and dignity and worth. Um, so whatever it means to be made in God's image is true of humanity alone. So how do we think of artificial intelligence, all right? It's not human, got it, what is it? Uh, I think the best class of things to put AI into and to think well about it is as a tool that humans develop. Remember, what did God say? God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. And in our task of ruling and subduing the earth and filling it out, uh, it's very appropriate for these humans to use their ingenuity and the things at hand to create tools to help them in that work. So one way, um, we're going to talk about shovels for a minute, okay? So just stop thinking about AI and just think about something as simple as a shovel, and there will be some parallels here, okay? Uh, first question, um, shovels, are they helpful? Yes, good thing, bad thing? It's good. Shovels are good, right? Anyone who's ever had to dig a hole knows, right? Shovels are better than hams, right? Now let's talk about tools because actually they're fascinating if you think about it, right? One, um, what do tools do? They make us more efficient, more productive, right? It's the whole work smarter, not harder, right? When you employ a tool, you can dig a hole faster and more easily than without it. They apply leverage. Technology is a tool that helps us live out our God-given callings, according to Jason Thacker. Um, I think we th should think of narrow AI as a tool, much like a shovel. Tools simply enable us to be more efficient with time, energy, and productivity. Second point. Is a shovel evil? Could be. Thank you, Charlene. Is this, is this shovel good or evil? Right? Yeah, it could be. Why do you say that? Give me. Yeah, right, right. Okay, good. Digging holes, good. Hitting people with it, bad, right? Um, and the thing is, the shovel is not good or evil, right? It's how it's employed. Right? Tools are powerful, but they're not good or evil. It's how they're employed and who they're employed by and to what end. So it's the application of a tool that is either good or bad, not the tool itself. I think that's how we should think of narrow AI. Okay? It's a tool. It's neither good nor bad. But how it is employed can be good or bad. Um, maybe an example with a different kind of technology would help. Um, so video cameras. Are video cameras good or bad? Right? It depends on how it's employed, right? You can use a video camera to capture family memories. Remember cherished events. You can use video cameras to protect innocent people by putting them in places that should be monitored, right? Making sure there's accountability. Or they could be used for evil. They can be used to spy on people. They can be used to film things that shouldn't be filmed, right? It's how the tool is employed that makes it good or bad. It's not the tool itself. So AI is like a shovel or a video camera. It's not good or evil in and of itself. It's a tool. It's a very powerful tool. And therefore, when it is wielded by someone trying to do evil with it, it has a lot of capability. If it's wielded by someone trying to use it for good, it has a lot of good capability to it. All right. So it's like a shovel, except... <laughs> Here's a complicating factor to consider. Um, so yeah, one practical question you should always ask is, who is using this technology and what are they trying to do with it? Right? Who's using the shovel? What are they trying to do with it? That makes the difference. Who is using this AI technology and what are they trying to do with it? Um, here's the complicating factor. AI is not simply something we choose to use like we've been talking about. It's something that is actually going on in the background most of the time when we don't even realize it. So for example, um, I go on YouTube to look up a video about how to play a song on guitar, right? 
I'm trying to employ technology in a, in a certain way just to learn how to do something. But you know what's going on in the background? YouTube is doing its own thing, right? And employing AI technology to learn more about me and the IP address I'm using and the things I'm interested in. And how, what's their motivation? Is it good or bad? Usually for a profit, at least, right? As we're using various technological tools, AI is actually being used on us. And a lot of times we don't realize it. And so I think one of the applications of this is that uh, we need to be more mindful of how AI may be using as, uh, being used as a tool on us. We need to think about who's wielding that tool, who's holding it, and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, another example, uh, many of you know, or I've heard the term algorithm before, right? Social media, YouTube, almost now increasingly so just average everyday internet sites or news sites are using algorithms. Algorithm is just another term for narrow AI, okay? And what is the algorithm trying to do or what are they trying to use the algorithm to do? Do you guys know, for the most part? What are they trying to do with it? There you go. Increase your engagement, right? Facebook wants you to use Facebook more. <laughs> Instagram wants you to use Instagram more. Your news site that you like wants you to read more news from their site and less news from other sites. So what are they doing? They're constantly, the AI working behind the scenes, whether you realize it or not, is gauging your interest level. If you read an article and very quickly click away, it knows you did that, and it will give you less articles like that. If you read an article and you read the whole thing and then you click on another link to read a related article, it says, oh, this kind of thing keeps this person's attention and it'll give you more articles like that. Okay. It's trying to keep you on it, right? And have you use that avenue more and more, which means what we should expect is that uh, AI is being wielded as a tool on all of us to get us to spend more time using the products, uh, especially online digital things we use. We should expect the addictiveness of online things, social media, to go up. Why? Because AI is really good and really smart, and it's being employed that way. The tool is being used, the shovel is being used on us to try and capture your attention and keep your attention for longer and longer. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't use Facebook or social media or Twitter or whatever, although I don't know if anyone's using Twitter anymore. Um, but um, we need to realize what is going on, is that in some ways it's being used against us. All right, one more note about tools before we go on. All right, a tool. Um, let's just think about it really quickly, okay? Imagine uh, you dig all the holes with your hands. Dig a bunch of holes with your hands. What's going to happen to your hands? Think through that. How is that going to shape you as a person if you dig a bunch of holes using only your body? Now think about how different a person would become over time if they dig a bunch of holes using a shovel. You're going to work different muscles, right? You're going to get calluses in different places. Your hands are going to become more sensitive to the grip of the shovel, right? And here's this really interesting thing about tools, is that the tools that we use the most often and over time, uh, we don't just use them, in some ways they shape us. Extended use of any tool shapes the user of that tool. Make sense? Just like using a shovel a bunch over time will strengthen certain muscles in your body, give you calluses certain places. It, it shapes you to use a tool. And I just thought this would be an interesting experiment to actually talk about and discuss. If AI is a tool, then our use of it will, over time, shape us as people, shape the ways we think. So uh, this is a real question I really want you to answer. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts. How might extensive use of AI technologies affect us if we use them more and more often? What do you guys think? What are your thoughts? To give an example that's not even an AI technology, I'm so grateful for calculators. I mean, 
Can your calculator do math better than you can? Is that okay? I think it's great. Um, yes, if you understand the basic. <laughs> That's true. That's a great point, Steve. Yeah, yeah, you have to understand the basic principles. Uh, but I am probably not as good at math as I would be if I didn't have a calculator. Having a calculator has shaped me. Um, using these technologies in various ways will shape us. Um, and it's good to think honestly through that as Christians. How are we being shaped as people, as disciples? How is our thinking being shaped? Great discussion. All right, so here's where we're going. We talk about narrow versus general AI. The only kind of AI we have is narrow. General AI, we're a long time away from that. It may not even be a possibility. Um, we talk about humans being made in God's image. Every single human has the same fundamental calling on their life to reflect God in this world. And that helps us understand AI as a tool that humans employ or use to do this God-given task of ruling this world. Tools are not good or bad, but they are powerful. So they can be used for great good or for great bad by those who wield them. So now putting all this together, let's talk about some, a couple practical issues. Uh, number one, um, keeping AI in its place. So here's the practical conclusion. I believe Christians should affirm the use and application of narrow AI technologies. As long as number one, AI is kept in its proper place. That's what we're gonna talk about first. And then number two, as long as human dignity is preserved and we work to preserve that. Well, what do I mean by that? Uh, let's talk about keeping AI in its place. Uh, this relates to a lot of the funding for AI research, if you dig underneath the surface, it is done by either organizations or really wealthy people. And if you dig into their philosophy, a lot of it is actually obsessed with uh, something called transhumanism. The goal of transhumanism is to become more than human, to go past what it means right now to be human. Uh, there's a lot of people who hope to one day, you know, upload their consciousness and their mind to the cloud. And if you stop for a minute and think about what's driving that, what do they want? They want eternal life. They want to overcome the limits of being human. Well, I think Christians should affirm AI technologies. We cannot affirm some of these motivations and why some of them are being developed. Um, so Jason Thacker in his book, The Age of AI, writes this. He says, I believe that we as humans talking in general, that we long to create something that is more intelligent than ourselves because we know that we are not perfect. We want to create something stronger than us because we know that we are truly weak. We desire to be like God because deep down we know that we aren't in control of our lives or the universe. Our pursuit of technological advances is most often motivated not by a desire to glorify God, but by the sinful pursuit to achieve the unachievable, to be God's ourselves. Uh, I think he's absolutely right that when you look at the underlying motivations of some of the people working for the advancement of AI, there is an unbiblical and I think even idolatrous motivation at play. And so again, while we should affirm specific technologies that come out and the gifts that they can bring and the tools that they are, it's like some of the people developing those tools are doing for pretty bad reasons. If you're a Christian in this world, you should not be working for those reasons. Um, AI is not our savior. Humans don't simply need to be upgraded. Uh, we need to be saved. And we don't look forward to escaping death through technological advancement. Uh, we look forward to the resurrection of the dead. That's what we look forward to as Christians. So we need to keep AI in its proper place. Um, it is not our savior. It's a great tool but when humans bow down to something they created, that too happens in the Bible, doesn't it? That's called idolatry. We need to keep AI technology in its place. We don't bow down to it. We use it in service to God. And secondly, we need to work to preserve human dignity. This is an interesting idea I came across, uh, and I think there's a good truth to it, that we should be careful not to treat people like machines. Again, talking about how to, the use of tools shapes us. Um, 
the fact that many of us are connected so often with various tools can make it tempting to treat people that way. People are not tools. Every single person you have ever come across was created in God's image and is someone for whom Jesus came and gave his life. We cannot treat people like machines. And vice versa, we probably should not treat machines like people because they are not. They don't have the same value or dignity or, or, or worth. That doesn't mean like, you know, start cursing at your phone or something. Um, but just, it, it's a different thing and we should be careful, right, to not fall in love with chat GPT, all right? Uh, this goes back to something, uh, Isaac, you were saying about um, assuming accountability or responsibility. This is something we need to work to work out. Um, someone needs to be held responsible. Some human needs to be held responsible for what ultimately happens. And a lot of times programmers are like, well, the, the, the program has become so advanced and self-learning that I don't even know what all is going on. And so I would just say from an ethical standard, um, if you don't want to take responsibility, then you should make it open source, right? where other people can see what's going on and influence that programming. Um, that's a little more in depth. But uh, programmers either need to assume responsibility or become more transparent with what's going on in the programming, what the AI is trying to accomplish. And finally, uh, a practical thing. I think we might need to consider offering financial and practical care for those who may need to retrain in this world, new world and find a new career. Uh, just one example of many that we may have to face. A lot of people make their living doing truck driving. If self-driving vehicles continues to learn and get really good at that, um, a machine to do that is much cheaper than a human to do that. And we may not have truck drivers in the future. What about all those truck drivers? Well, we... <laughs> yeah, true, they cannot. That's a good point. Maybe we'll get more mechanics. <laughs> um, and there's lots of things like that uh, where we may have a need to offer practical care, financial support for people who may be out of a job or jobs may be more difficult in the future. And on that note, if you are a young person or you know a young person who's trying to think about what to do with their lives, uh, this is advice from uh, Max Tegmark about, um, whoops, yeah, why did it not come up? Uh, career advice. It's not coming up. It's coming up for me, so I'll read it. Uh, these are questions to consider. Um, if you have a child or you're looking at college choices, uh, these are things to consider. Um, does it require interacting with people and using social intelligence? If yes, that's a good thing, right? Um, consider careers and pathways that involve creativity and coming up with clever solutions. And does it require working in an unpredictable environment where things change often and you need to account for new circumstances? Those are all good career pathways to consider. And if all the answers are no, you may want to consider possibly a different career path. All of this um, is a lot of change in our world. Our world is changing and it can be kind of scary. Uh, Jason Thacker in his book reminds us that this is nothing new. Here's what he writes referring to the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, which started in England in the 18th century before spreading around the world, brought about rapid change in society and in the development of technology. This shift from a farming lifestyle to a reliance on factories and manufacturing took place in such a short time compared with the thousands of years of modest change before it. Jay Richards describes the Industrial Revolution as a revolution, not because it was an immediate change that came out of nowhere, but because the time scale was so short. Changes took place faster than ever before and brought about fears of job losses and mass poverty. And I underline that in my book. It's like, that sounds familiar. Changes took place faster than ever before and brought about fears of job loss and mass poverty. These changes brought about fear because for thousands of years, work remained remarkably similar. But, and here's the point for us, but contrary to these fears, the industrial, industrial revolution actually led to massive job creation and more prosperity than the world had ever seen. So big change, yes. Um, but it's our 
kind of gut response tends to be fear at the unknown. Like, oh, what are we going to lose? And according to history, technological development leads to actually job creation um, and more prosperity in general, which is better for more people. Now, that doesn't mean it's all going to be rosy and easy. Um, there are hard issues we have to think through, especially as Christians. Um, but I hope and I pray that all of us are maybe a little more, uh, maybe have some boxes, some mental boxes to put these things in um, today and now. So let me pray for us. And then I hear some people outside who want to come in. Um, but I'm happy to discuss and kind of do an a unofficial Q&A. Um, I'll kind of come over to this side. So if you want to discuss any of these items further or want to borrow one of these books, uh, we'll do that after I close this in prayer. God, I thank you that we don't need to be afraid. I pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment. And God, would you help us keep technology in its proper place? God, would you guard against any parts of our hearts that might be stepping towards idolatry. Be excited about the prospect of you know, cheating death, as it were. Or motivated by a desire to control the world. Because we know you are on the throne, Jesus. You are the ruler, the rightful ruler. Would you give us wisdom as, um, as I'm sure new technologies will continue to come out? Would you help us know how to care for people first? And again, would you help us uh, navigate this world with grace and with wisdom? We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.